Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the World Discoveries Research Showcase. Uh, I could have entitled this talk any number of things. Um, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of history, the background of um, what it took to get to where I am in terms of the research we do, uh, which I think is very interesting because it actually talks about patenting, missed opportunities, and uh, what it takes to actually make big companies. So if we go back to the 1930s, a gentleman by the name of Linus Pauling was studying proteins and how proteins actually got put together. And he discovered an obscure little fact that hemoglobin, which is the molecule that carries oxygen in your blood, actually had a magnetic property. And that magnetic property of hemoglobin actually depended upon whether hemoglobin was carrying oxygen or not. Well, nobody cared about that, other than for the fact that he won a Nobel Prize in 1954, but it had no dollar value associated with it. Fast forward 10 years, and these two gentlemen, Ed Purcell at Harvard and Felix Bloch at Stanford, discovered a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR. And they published in the same issue of Physical Review. They were 80, 90 pages apart in the issue. So when the person at Tech Transfer, or the person at Stevenson Lawson, or the person in your department says, I'll get to that next week, 90 pages sometimes makes the difference between getting a Nobel Prize and not. So time is important in commercialization, would be the motto there. So NMR was basically a technique that built on a number of other Nobel Prizes that allowed you to listen to the magnetic field of nuclear spins. And these two gentlemen fortunately agreed to shake hands and win the Nobel Prize together in 1952. And a Boston Herald reporter who covered the announcement said, Professor Purcell's discovery won't revolutionize industry or help the housewife. These were the two important groups, housewives and industry. But it does provide physicists a precision tool for me measuring very precisely the magnetic fields of nuclei. Well, Harvard University believed that reporter, and so they didn't do anything about this discovery. But this young upstart university by the name of Stanford actually patented the discovery. And patents, as we know, are useless unless somebody buys the rights. And so they sold the rights to, in fact, a former grad and his brother, the Varian brothers. And the Varian brothers, who had already invented the microwave tube, the klystron, uh, took this technology, NMR, and turned it into a major analytical chemistry success story. And they started in their little garage. You can see the old Model B, I think, or Model A, I think, over there. Uh, that's where they started Varian Associates in the 1940s. It was just down the street, actually a few blocks away from another very famous garage. Anybody know what that garage is? That's where Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard founded Hewlett Packard. That garage was sold for $3 million a few years ago. Um, and ironically, uh, Hewlett Packard spun off their analytic division as Agilent Technologies in 1999, and Agilent just bought Varian for one and a half billion dollars. So Harvard, not so smart in that whole deal. Um, these two companies were in fact the first two companies in an area we now call Silicon Valley. They've been there for 65, 70 years now. So let me tell you a little bit about nuclear magnetic resonance. So the idea with NMR is you can put something that contains certain types of nuclear spins, for example, water, which has protons. And if you put a water bottle into a magnet, over time, it actually generates a little bit of magnetism. OK, 
Okay, these are the nuclear spins that are lining up with the magnetic field. And you can talk to these spins. You can talk to them by actually irradiating them with a brief radio frequency pulse. Okay? And the frequency of that pulse depends on the magnetic field strength that you've put these water molecules into. Now talking is great, listening is better. And it turns out that after you've talked to the spins and perturbed them from where they were, they return back to where they want to be. And you get a signal back that lasts for a few milliseconds and is very weak, but if you listen carefully, you can learn a lot about the environment where those spins are. And in order to talk and to listen, you use something called a radio frequency coil, which in its simplest form is a coil of wire with a capacitor that resonates at the frequency that you're interested in, a basis of all modern radio technologies. Well, fast forward another couple of decades, uh, Varian, one of six U.S. companies that have Nobel laureates who worked for them, um, had one by the name of Richard Ernst, and he mostly did his work in analytic chemistry. But from that work, he actually came up with an idea for spatially localizing the NMR signal. So normally you would put your sample in a glass tube, put it in the magnet, put a coil around it, and get a signal. He figured out a way to actually localize signals in multiple places in space, which turned out to be the basis of magnetic resonance imaging. He won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1991. He was smart enough to file a US patent on this technique, however. Two other gentlemen, uh, Paul Lauterbur, who was at State University of New York at Stony Brook, and Sir Peter Mansfield at Nottingham University in England came up with the hardware methods for doing MRI and jointly won the Nobel Prize in 2003. And in another classic case, the guys at Stony Brook thought, eh, interesting idea, but I don't think it has any commercial value, and they didn't patent it. Nottingham did, Peter Mansfield is the only person I know, the only scientist I know, who owns six helicopters. Uh, anatomy of an MR scanner. Well, MR scanners require big and even bigger magnets. Uh, we put a number of coils that can manipulate the magnetic fields in them, one of which is the radio frequency coil I talked about. And radio frequency coils are a small enough, tractable enough device that they are something that enterprises like universities and small industrial partners can actually make, as opposed to magnets which weigh 28 tons. So this was the first MRI image ever made. I don't think any of you could actually tell what it is. It was made at 0.1 Tesla. Tesla is a unit of magnetic field. It took three hours. And uh, in fact, when it was published in the journal Nature, they had to include an anatomic drawing so you'd know what it was. That's a human heart. Fast forward to our 3T scanner at the Robarts, one of two we actually have. These images, human heart patients, look like human hearts, and they took 30 seconds. And the reason that we've made that progress in 20 short years, really, is increases in magnetic field, which give you increases in sensitivity, and improved radio frequency coils, which also give you increases in sensitivity. Now, MRI has been clinically used at field strengths of about one and a half Tesla for 20 plus years now. But one of the major motivators for pushing field strengths above that actually came from another discovery. This one made at Bell Labs, where they have 13 Nobel laureates, uh, by a gentleman by the name of Seiji Ogawa. And what he discovered, and you probably won't be able to tell in this lighting, was you could make images of the brain that depended upon the oxygenation state of the hemoglobin. 
So remember my first slide, that obscure little thing that hemoglobin could be magnetic? Nobody cared about it? Well, 56 years later, somebody figured out a way to put it to good use. And that's how long discoveries often take. That's how long you have to invest. Bell Labs funded him for 30 years to make that discovery. So that's what it takes. Uh, Seiji uh, hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet, but he did win the Japan Prize and he did win the Gardner Prize uh, a few years back. And the technique he discovered has come to be known as functional MRI. Functional MRI is a non-invasive imaging technique that allows you to figure out what areas of the brain are active in response to all kinds of tasks. So here you have somebody staring at a screen where lights are blinking and the back of their brain is actually going on and off with that stimulus. And so we could combine the strengths of MRI in terms of giving you beautiful structure with actually superimposing function on that. It allows you to do all kinds of useful things. On the left is actually a scan of our university president thinking about different areas on campus. And as you can tell, because Dr. Chukma was whole and intact and standing here an hour ago, uh, not, MRI is actually a non-invasive technique. And it allows you to figure out what's going on in the brain of individuals like this. I suspect he doesn't get a lot of sleep and he worries about budgets a lot more than Homer Simpson. So where do you find these magnets? Well, you could go to Las Vegas and there's a nice store in, in Caesar's uh, Palace called Magnet Maximus and you can buy magnets for a dollar. Or you can go to England where the two major manufacturers of magnets in the world are and you can buy magnets for anywhere from three to ten million dollars. So we chose the latter and here is uh, our Varian 7 Tesla human system being craned into the Robarts about a year ago and this is what it looks like in its home. So I talked about Tesla and units of magnetic field. Um, this is 140,000 times the Earth's magnetic field to give you an idea. And when you make uh, NMR or MRI images, uh, I talked about RF coils. The coil that has been used for 25 years in MRI is something called a birdcage uh, because it looks like a birdcage. And when you put a human head into a uh, coil like that, you can transmit radio waves and you can receive the signal and you can reconstruct it using all those technologies that Lauterbur and Mansfield and Ernst and so on invented and make images of a human head. And they look pretty good. And radiologists make a pretty good living interpreting those images. If you really want lots of signal, you actually use a small coil. It gives you more sensitivity, but of course the coverage is very small. And so this is always the trade-off you make. Big coil, lots of coverage, smaller sensitivity. Small coil, little coverage, lots of sensitivity. Well, what happens, that's all well and good at one and a half Tesla, and even to three Tesla to a large extent. But what happens when you go to seven Tesla? Well, one and a half T, the wavelength of this frequency, so the wavelength of the radio wave you're using, is quite long. And so it's fairly homogeneous over something the size of a human head. So you can make homogeneous images. At 70, everything goes nuts because the wavelength is now 12 centimeters. And so you set up standing waves in the human head. So how do you get around that? Well, one way to do it, and something that we're actually approaching in our lab, is to make an array of small coils and drive each of these coils with a different amplitude and phase because when you do that, you can actually tailor the radio frequency field. And this is how it works. So here's a coil, oh, you just saw the coil, it has 15 little paddles. And this is the field from each of the 15 paddles. If you actually transmit with the right phases and the right frequencies, you can actually make an absolutely gorgeous image at 7T. And the comparator is not to go look at what the radiologists look at, the comparator is to go look in the pathology books because the images have that kind of detail. So these are the kinds of technologies we develop in our lab. 
they build on, on a history of advancement that really has been 70 years coming from people asking obscure questions, people making horribly financially expensive errors in patenting. Uh, thank you very much.